Episode 13 with Greg Reed. Hey, Barn Raisers, one and all. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Dan Stones, and this is indeed the Barn Raisers podcast, where we sit down with the world's ultimate team players in an attempt to answer just one simple question. How do the most effective teams on the planet really work? To answer that question, I scour the globe to find the men and women who have the stories, the insights, and the experiences that will help us on our quest. For those of you who are new, welcome aboard, and thank you for giving us a shot. For those of you who have been with us before, welcome back, and thank you for your ongoing support, for sharing us with your friends, and for doing those reviews. It all means the world to me, and I love that you're part of this team. Let's not waste any time today, as I am super excited to introduce our guest. I know you're going to love it. The show starts now. On his bio page at Amazon, Greg Reed is described as a natural entrepreneur known for his giving spirit and a knack for translating complicated situations into simple, digestible concepts. He's also called an action-taking phenomenon, someone who turns strategy into results, and relationships are deep and rich in the space he orbits. He's a firm believer in the role of win-win partnerships and making a difference in others to succeed. He can be found having a great time brewing up inspiration, occasionally breaking into song and dance, and being of service to those around him. With the exception of the song and dance bit, I couldn't have written a truer word. Greg is an author, but he's also a filmmaker. He's a keynote speaker, and he's the creator of one of the most highly recommended networking events in the world. But it's not what he does that makes Greg an ultimate team player. It's who he is. There's a million different words, angles, experiences, and achievements that I could choose to highlight how great Greg is, but that would be doing him an injustice. He didn't agree to come on this show to promote any of those things. In fact, he came on the show simply because I asked him. When I reached out, the only reply I got back was simply, happy to do a 30-minute spot. How may I be of contribution? Greg Reed. That really does say it all. Other than letting you know that our conversation was a little shorter than most, at the time I had the feeling that he must have been having a phone date with Bill Gates or Elon Musk or someone like that. But I now realize it could just have easily have been another guy like me, someone who he promised his time to. I'm not going to say anything more than that. It will all make perfect sense as we go. It's my privilege and honor to welcome... Mr. Greg Reed. Good to know. How do you describe the business you're in? Well, one that's made up, I guess. <laughs> I've got the great luxury in the world. You know, I got to create my own lifestyle. And so every single day, I get up to a new opportunity. One day I'm a filmmaker, one day I'm an author, one day I'm an events promoter, and it just literally changes. And I do it by having singular focused. And what that means is when I put on my hat to do movies, that's all I focus on. And as soon as I turn the hat, then I focus on my events. And then I turn the hat and I focus on writing. I don't attempt to do all things at the same exact time. Have you got a favorite part about what you get to do? I'm guessing it's probably all of it, but is there something that you like doing more than anything else? Yeah, creating. I think that's what it comes down to is creation is what gives my life the blood flow that keeps me going. So it's always constantly moving. There's a term I use called progress, not perfection. And that's how I live my life. Absolutely. I can, I wholeheartedly agree with it. And I think it's also part of it when you have those sort of so many things that are going on, people from the outside look at it and say, you do all these different things, but you, you sum it up as creativity. Yeah. Creating, whether it's a book or an event or a film or a a product or a project. Yeah. I feel like we're creating something to actually have a impact in people's lives. It's not a selfish uh, endeavor. There's always to make an impact and a ripple effect around me. 
And that comes through so clear in everything that you do is that that's another theme that comes through clearly. Um, it's funny how things, I think, as you go through life, <laughs> things become clearer in hindsight. How do you make sense of your journey so far with all these different twists and turns? Oh, it's a, it's a cluster mess. <laughs> That's <laughs> part of the game. You know, one of the greatest uh, interviews I ever did was Truett Cathy, founder of Chick-fil-A restaurants in America. It's a big restaurant chain. And I asked him, I says, you know, I want to be a billionaire like you. What do I do different? And he says, stop planning so much. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, last year you had a lot of plans. I go, yeah. And he goes, how did that work out? And he goes, understand this, that everything might come to fruition, but it won't go as you expect it to. And there's an old adage, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, right? <laughs> and he said to look for and capitalize on unexpected opportunity. So if I want to get to the end of the street and that's my goal, I have to get out of my house and take action and move towards that goal. But where a planner is going to plan every stop and where they're going to take a break, I'm looking for opportunity. Did a kid leave a skateboard or a bicycle out to make my journey short? If I'm lucky, I'll wave down a neighbor and I'll hitch a ride to the end of the street. Either way, I'll get to my goal. I just don't mind exactly how it has to happen. Right. So being completely open and, and accepting of, of whatever is at, at that time. Absolutely. The whole idea is to literally look for and capitalize on unexpected opportunity. Is there something you tell yourself to do that? I mean, do you, do you set an intention for that? Is it, how, do you, how do you have that habit? Because so much of us react to whatever happens, but when you're looking for opportunity, I suppose you're responding more than anything else. But how do you get that discipline or that focus to actually do that time and time again? It's interesting. I have a five-year-old son. Every time we go anywhere, doesn't make a difference, amusement park, grocery store, we always come home and he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out money and he slaps it on the table. I go, Colt, why is it no matter where we go, you always find money? And he looks at me and says, I look for it, daddy. The reality is ours, whatever we look for, whatever we seek is also seeking us. And whatever we look for, we'll find more of it. And that's how. It's not like you say, take the plan out of it, take the strategies away. It's as simple as just being open and looking for it. Correct. And, and be willing to adjust and adapt along the journey. That's the key. As long as you have that adaptability, that's where the miracle is. So many people get stuck up on the exact hows and the dimensions and things. And that's not what the secret of prosperity is. Every billionaire I've ever interviewed has told me that their final product or business or their entity was nothing even closely as they first imagined it but they were willing and able to adjust and adapt along the quest. Yeah, for sure. I look at it as being you can either have a plan or a map, and the plan's to go from A to B, and here's the steps to get there. But if you've got a map, then you can see the whole landscape. So there's not just A to B, but what's around it and what else might come across. Yeah, there you go. All right, let me ask you, Charlie Tremendous Jones, who is this man for people that are listening, and uh, what exactly does he mean to you? He was my father figure. You know, he was a great motivational legend. And he had a quote says that you are the same today as you'll be in five years, except for two things, the people you meet and the books you read. It's who you hang out with. It's what you put in your head that determines your character as a person. So in high school, if you hung around smokers, chances are you're a smoker. If you hung around jocks or jock. Same thing applies today. If we hang around people that complain, gripe and moan, that becomes our dialogue. But if we hang around people that are positive and solution searching, then that too becomes a conversation that plays in our head. Right. And and the, the part about the people that we meet, how important is that in the, in, the, in the scheme of things? Because we talk about teams on this show and my whole life's driven towards helping people create better teams and, and better collaboration. So how important is that people part to you? Well, you already know the answer and you're kind of leading me down a rabbit holes, but that's everything. I believe that association is the key to everything in our life. It's your relationships, personal and professional and creativity and every single thing. So if we are a reflection of the people we hang around the most and our income, attitude and lifestyle is the average of the group, it makes sense to surround yourself with people that are not only getting the results you want, but they're living a lifestyle that you emulate. And how do you do that? Like in a team context, whether it's in a business, a movie or book or whatever it is, you don't, it's very rare looking the research. It's very rare that you're working in isolation. Well, a team is everything, obviously, but you know, things have changed. Look, and I know you're going to probably have different answers from every single person you've interviewed other than me. So I'm going to be the one person to give you different feedback. Awesome. So the realities are I have a great team, but I've never seen them. I've never even met 
95% of the people that work with me on a daily basis. Never even, you know, I couldn't tell you who they are, pick them out of a lineup, never know. And the way that is, is because in modern technology, you're in Australia, I'm in California. You know, the whole realities are you don't have to be sitting around a boardroom in today's society to get things done. So my ghost writers are amazing and copy editors. They've never even met each other, but they're all working together as a collaboration. Same thing as my Instagram guys don't know my Facebook guys. Same thing. But you know what? As a team, we're all working towards a common theme. And I think it's having that clarity of vision, of focus, of knowing exactly what we want, and then surround yourself with the people that can not only help you bring it to life, but also believe in the same dream along the way. Fantastic. And when you're, and I don't think that that's different, um, such a different answer. It's just a different context for how you view teams. And I get that question a lot with the groups that I work with. Do you work with teams that aren't in the same place that are geographically separate? Can you help us build a team in that sense? The answer is of course. Um, yeah, actually in today's world, I mean, there's a website called upwork.com. That's the secret of life right there, man. You can go on and, you know, for, $500, no matter what you're looking for, you can get someone with a PhD somewhere in the world to do the work for you. And that's what's so brilliant. And what do you look for when you're going to do that? Do you, or, or do you actually have someone that looks for that and pulls it together for you? I mean, what are you looking for when you're looking for a collaborative partner that you haven't seen, haven't spoken to, and you've got a really important project that's creative and means so much to you? But I always do all that stuff myself. And back to the original answer that I was saying earlier, to get what you want, surround yourself with people that are getting the results you want. You know, I have a theory. You surround yourself with people you have respect for, not people you have influence over. So I look for people that are the greatest people in their industry and hire them. For example, uh, it's not a secret, but right now I'm writing a new book. It's called Wealth Hack. It's coming out in 2019. Been traveling the world, meeting people worth $100 million to $1 billion. And I cannot write myself out of a paper bag. Now, yes, I've had 64 books and 45 languages and 28 bestsellers. It doesn't mean I've written all those books. It means that they're my messages. It's my concept. It's my you know, theories. But I have other people put it in a book form so people would actually read it. And one person I've incorporated to write this book with me, his name is Gary Krebs. And what's interesting is he's the former publisher of one of the largest publishing companies in the entire world called McGraw-Hill. And when he left, he came on board with me and now he and I collaborative are writing this book together. So the whole idea is surround yourself with people that are doing what you want. Let me give you another example. Mm. When I first got into the book industry, I wanted to become a best-selling author. So I did not hang out with people who wrote books. You know who I hung out with? People who sold books. <laughs> They're right. two completely different people. And so if you surround yourself with people that are doing what you want, ultimately you get to do it too. And I think that becomes with clarity about what your ultimate goal is as well. You've got to be crystal clear on that because writing a book's different to selling a book, as you just said. That's, yeah, a, that's exactly. a big distinction. I even got a, de a domain one time called writing. It's the easy part because you know, everyone says writing a book's hard. Well, until you do one, but on your 60, 70, it's, a, it's pretty easy. The main thing is how do you sell them? Because uh, last year there was 968,000 books published 99.4% sold 100 copies or less because that's all your family and friends will buy. And so the whole idea is selling books is a completely different industry. Well, guess what? It's the same thing. Everyone wants to be a public speaker and get paid to do a keynote speech, but getting booked for that keynote speech is a different, completely different business. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus, some takeaways there that <laughs> I certainly need to be looking at with uh, some of the stuff that I'm working on at the moment as well. So no, that's great. Let me talk to you then about Three Feet from Gold. I've got to say, that's one of my favorite books of all time. I just loved it. Everything about it was fantastic. In the author's note, you say that the book came from real life experience. But how did that book really come about? And my, my, I suppose my question is, is the jacket story true? Okay, so the book Three Feet from Gold is an amazing story. And most of that is all true. As, as I said in there, the three characters uh, that were kind of made up or a composite was Mr. Bucklin, which is like the main mentor. And he is a composite of all my mentors, but he emulated Charlie Tremendous Jones, six foot four, big guy, that whole story. And yes, Charlie gave me a jacket. And then door number two, uh, Mia, my wife, was a composite of all three wives that I've had. I've been married three times. And true story, I came home one day in my XW1 and literally took every single thing out of the house as a joke. And her and I are still friends. But she, I, I remember I left and said, hey, and I go, look, since we're separating, you take whatever you want out of the house. 
you know, whatever's left over, I'll keep and, you know, we'll part our ways. And I came back and she literally took every single nail, light bulb, <laughs> everything out. And, and, and I thought it was so cute. So I, I wrote it into the story. And so that is basically the, the evolution of life. And then Dave, my brother, is a composite character of those suffering of addiction. Um, in January, I'll have 30 years sober. So those are the people that have suffered around me that have come and gone. And I kept it real saying it's not as easy as it, as mm. it might appear. I mean, it must have been just a trip doing all those interviews and, and doing all those things. When you wrote the book, were you already, and I'm sorry, I don't know the exact timeline of how it all came about, but were you already doing those sort of interviews with those people? Because the sense of sort of wonder that you took into each of those interviews was, I thought was, was really, really good. You know, I, before that, so a lot of people think Three Feet from Gold was my first book or breakout, but it was like my 30th book, I think, something yeah. like that, 25th or something. And so I was already on this quest, already on this journey. I just wasn't in an association with such an illustrious, great organization called the Napoleon Health Foundation, which, you know, is everything. And it's just was such a, like getting a Willy walk a golden ticket <laughs> is to go around the country and meet people and using it as a reason to open up doors of influence. And it's been a, a magical journey. And again, that was 10 years ago yeah. that we did the book. And since then, we've done, you know, I think six projects with the foundation and it's been an amazing journey. How do you know when you're three feet from gold? Can you know when you're three feet from gold? Yeah, the concept for those who are not familiar with the story is a story about R.U. Darby, a gold miner who literally gave up three feet away from the biggest gold strike in U.S. history. And the moral is how many times do people quit one class short from a degree or sales or marketing or marriage? It's easy to quit. It's the people that persevere to go the extra mile. It's interesting. Uh, a good author, a good writer writes about what they need help with the most. And I just told you, I've been married, divorced, I'm a quitter. And so I've had the challenge. I've quit everything. So I went on this journey for myself to learn how to keep going. And I've realized that not only am I no longer a quitter, but I see everything through. I have that stickability factor. And the whole concept for me is that you know when it's three feet from gold, when you know it. Meaning you don't hope, you wish, believe, you know. You know that feeling when you go, no, I, I know. It hasn't hit right, but I know this is going to break. That's the difference. But when you're doing what's called an if, when, then deal, those are usually go sour. That means if this happens and when this comes together, then this will be my reward. Yeah. How many of those ever come? That's like, your, that's like the lottery ticket. So if it's an if, when, then, I think it's okay to adjust. But when you know you're on the right track, you know, no matter what people are saying that you're on the quest, that's when you keep persevering. For sure. And I compare that then to this other thought. I'm interested to get your thoughts on it. But this, this idea that people like to talk about is fail fast and fail often. What are your thoughts on that sort of a theory? Yeah, I'm not a big fan. I mean, anyone that sets themselves up to fail, <laughs> to fail fast and fail often, I think is ludicrous. I, I, I just have no understanding of that. I, I, everything I do, I go to succeed. I mean, I, I never get up to the plate, you know, in, in a baseball game and hoping to strike out so I can get to that hit. I just don't think that way. I, I, I just think everything I, I attempt to do, I give every single thing that I've got at it. But the difference is I've learned something called non-attachment. Detachment means you just don't care. But mm. non-attachment means you give it every single thing you got, but you're not attached to the outcome. And by doing that gives you freedom to give every single thing an opportunity to succeed. Right. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And coming back to that idea about what you focus on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I hang out with the people that preach that stuff, and it just is so illogical to me. Uh, the whole idea is it's just the matter of actually going forward and attempting to win. Imagine if you played a, a, a tennis match. The person who plays to not lose – will lose. The person who plays the win will win. That's the way life works. So it only makes sense to always go out to give it everything you got. Of course. Okay, let's change gears a little bit. Let's come into to another project of yours. There's so many of these and I know we're pressed for time, so I'm sort of racing through, but the one I want to talk about is Secret Knock. Um, it's an idea that interests me greatly. It's something that I'd love to bring to the people in my part of the world in, in Australia. Can you explain what Secret Knock is for again for the listeners and and how did it all come about and how did it get started? Well, years ago, ten years ago, when I started the Three Feet from Gold movement, I was interviewing all these people and folks said, "Hey, I want to meet all these folks as well." And so, in my living room, 
I invited 12 of my friends to come over and meet some of the people that I went on the quest with. And it kind of just organically grew. There was no, nothing fed it and it grew and grew. And now we're a Forbes and Inc and entrepreneur top event for business leaders worldwide. And we did it from a completely alternative place way before being disruptive was cool. We, we just were different. And I was watching all these events and they're trying to do these things where they put what's called butts in seats, like human beings and things, and they treat them like a commodity. And I says, what if we did the opposite of it? And then I said, well, what the other one, they said, they brag about all the speakers that are coming and how powerful they are. And I go, what if we did the opposite of that? And I came up with secret knock where it's a secret. And the whole thing is it costs $3,000 to go, but I will not tell you where it is or who will be there. Right. That's it. That's the way it works. And once you sign up and trust me, well, about a month before, I'll send you the information, closest hotels and all that good stuff, but I still won't tell you the location until just a few days before. And what happens is, you know, it's in San Diego, you know, it's on this date, so you can book your flights. But the realities are we don't have people just coming out of the woodworks. So I will never tell people who's coming to the next one, but I will tell you who came to the last one. Mm -hmm. The last one was pretty cool. We had the founder of Showtime TV. We had the founder of Ugg Boots, you know, right there from Australia. We had founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. We had founder of Chuck E. Cheese. We had the guy who invented the credit card magnetic strip. We had TV legends. Oh, Tonino Lamborghini flew in all the way from Italy. And we did a private Skype with Edward Snowden while he's in hiding, just as an example. And that was day one. And the whole idea is how do you surround yourself with these amazing human beings? So I give people that vehicle. Look, for three grand, you would never be able to have access to all these people individually, let alone in one place. So what I like to do is just bring together a you know, a community, a society where you have full access to these people on a you know two or three day basis. For sure, for sure. And and just to be clear, this isn't before everyone starts jumping on for secret knock. It, it's not like you just buy your ticket either, is it? it, it you've got to oh, actually go through a process. You got to go through a process. So yeah, I mean, here you go to secretknock.co. We left the M off so no one could find us and get everyone. <laughs> <laughs> secretknock.co and you do an application and then we call you and make sure that, you know, you don't wear a tinfoil hat or talk to dead aliens through your cat. I mean, <laughs> it took me a lot of effort to get access to these amazing people. And so therefore I want to introduce them to our friends that can you know, propel each other. And what's nice is usually everyone that I meet, entrepreneurs say, God, I'm just one contact away. I'm just one opportunity away. Well, that's us. If you're a brand new bagel shop, trust me, we are not your circle. But if you've been around for five years and you're now three bagel shops and you have no one else to talk to because no one understands the trials and tribulations of your leadership, we are your tribe. We're that group you've been waiting for your whole life. And I realize that successful people don't have other successful people to hang out with. And that's what we created. Yeah, it looks it looks fantastic. I've got to say, um, <laughs> having looked at the videos and everything like that, I, I, it would be a fascinating room to be a part of. One of the things that are there and you talk about we, we're, with Secret Knock is it's all about pioneers of change and advocates of collaboration. Obviously, as soon as I hear that word, my ears prick up and I start to look into it a bit more. What's the approach or mindset that you and the guests that come on have when it comes to collaboration? Have you seen after so many times and so many people a pattern in terms of collaboration? Well, I live it. Mm-hmm. Again, though, I, I, I'm the, yeah, I don't preach it. I, don't, I just live that. So, for example, in, in America, there's some other giant events like CEO Space, uh, Digital Footprint. There's amazing events going on. And we're all friends. So what I like to do is send all my people at Secret Knock to those events. And then they send them to mine. And we all work together. We're not competing against each other. We're helping one another. And I've realized that this is going to sound strange, but competition is becoming the new collaboration. I'm going to say it again. Competition is becoming the new collaboration. I'm going to give you an example. Mm. Back in the day, if you had a restaurant and you were out in the boondocks and it was a special thing and everyone get dressed up and go – No one wants to do that anymore. They want to go to restaurant row where there's 30 restaurants and it's amazing night out on the town. And by having that competition, it also creates collaboration because as soon as they leave your restaurant, they see a new place across the street and try it next time. And then they come back to yours. Same thing as a gas station. You see four different ones on the corners. And I realized that the competition is actually becoming a new collaboration. It sounds like that's sort of the doorway that you're looking for where there's competition. There's the opportunity for collaboration. 
Absolutely. I mean, it's really interesting. In America, you know, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but there's a franchise called McDonald's. And wherever they put a McDonald's, a Burger King goes right next door because McDonald's already did all the work and research and everything. And then a Starbucks goes right behind them because they've already done all the research. And the whole idea is everything follows suit. So having that competition is kind of a collaboration in its own way. That's right. And, and yeah, we've got, we've got exactly that, that situation in Australia. How do you then put your hand out? What's your, what's your thought and process? Uh, the approach you have to say, well, I'm putting my hand out. I know we're competing in, in a traditional sense or maybe in a, in a logical sense, but I want to collaborate. How do you do that approach? What's your, what's your sort of game plan for that? I think I never even address it. I just look for people I want to hang out with. I mean, the whole thing is you do business with people you know, like, and respect. So I wouldn't just go to anybody. I mean, I, I would go to an event and if I appreciate what they did and they were of integrity and you Google them and they're clean and you end up befriending these people and they're people you want to do business with and feel comfortable sending your friends and peers. I mean, I really respect my tribe. And so on the same note, when I say, Hey guys, you should go to this one next, they'd follow suit because I'm giving them great feedback. It would be disrespectful to myself and my community to send them somewhere I didn't. So I'm making sure that we're all in the same integral uh, standpoint so we all get along. Right. So it sounds like then you're not looking so much for what you're going to get out of a deal or what you're going to get out of the relationship. It's more about when you feel like you're ready to give into the relationship and what you're going to put into it. Exactly. I mean, would you imagine if I built up a 10 year perfect brand, which I did with Secret Knock, and then I told someone to go to some shyster snake oil sales guy event, I'm done. I'm ruined. It's, it's called brand slaughter. You just killed your own brand. So I believe that it's very cool that, you know, if I had a steakhouse and it was amazing, and imagine if someone's leaving that steakhouse and said, hey, uh, we appreciate you coming here. By the way, here's a, you know, 20% discount for the pizza place across the street. If you guys ever want pizza, you guys should check that place out. They're, we've been doing business with them and love them. Well, the chance of those people going from that steakhouse there is pretty darn good. And then when those pizza are leaving the steak, pizza place, say, hey, if you ever want steak, come over here. It's pretty awesome business. Now you're helping and sharing. That's 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 the future. That's that's where I'm doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So here's the scoop. We've got another about five or 10 minutes. What else we got? Let's do the top 10 quickly. We'll race through it. You're up for doing that? Let's do it. All right. Let's go. Number one, what is one thing you feel must be present or created for a team to succeed? Well, obviously, leadership is the number one answer, and it's clarity of the vision. Okay. Number two, what is one thing you feel must be avoided or overcome in order for a team to succeed? Ego and competition within the ranks, meaning that if people are trying to outdo each other for ranking rather than the positivity of the outcome, then that's a challenge. So the whole idea is sometimes if you have a big group setting or manager, some people suppress other people's ideas and concepts because they're trying to keep ranking. So it's important to make sure that we keep it ego free where everyone shares the credit. There's a great quote. It says, when everything goes right, it's their fault. If everything goes wrong, it's my fault. When everything goes without a care, it's because we're all working together. And that's how I live my life and my, my, my business now. Beautiful. I love it. Number three, what team, current or historic, would you love to have been a member of? Every Super Bowl winning team. I love the camaraderie and the, uh, the intensity, so to speak, you know, when they're in the final big game. What three qualities make someone a great teammate or colleague? Hmm. I will say like-minded focus, high energy, and a desire to complete the task at hand. I mean, so many times people start something and they, they don't complete it. And I'm just a big, powerful guy about completing the task. And if we got someone working together and our clear vision is we're going to get this done no matter what, the final outcomes, not up to us, but like, again, that non-attachment, but we are going to complete this and do the very best we can. Yep. Love it. Love it. What three qualities make someone a great coach or manager? You know, someone you have respect for, not someone you have influence over. Uh, the other part would be leadership comes from, I believe, non-chameleon qualities. That means that I don't want to see someone change every time the color changes or 
the emotions change. They, they, they're, they have a clear focus and vision all the single time and they always stay uh, true to it. And then last, which is probably the biggest one is integrity. You know, you want to do something with people that you know you can count on. Yep. Okay. Number seven, what is one thing that instantly makes you feel part of a team? When you're given the credit for the accomplishments that you've contributed to the team. I think that's what everyone does. Every group I've ever ran, every corporation I've ever, like right now I run seven corporations and they're all different, all different energies. But the biggest thing, people do less for money than they'll do for cause. Yeah. And so if somebody feels appreciated or heard, they're much more likely to stick around forever and, and more than the, the $50 or 50 cent or whatever raise you're going to give them. So the important thing is to make sure they're acknowledged. Okay, number eight, what is one thing that instantly makes you feel excluded from a team? The opposite of what I just said, shunned, ridiculed, you know, not listened to, that same thing. I mean, so it would be yin and yang. Yeah, the yeah. other side of the coin. Yeah, yeah. Number nine, what is your fondest team memory? I'd say selling my last big business. I started it from scratch and we grew it to a multi-million dollar business and as a collaboration, we sold it and everyone got a share in that. And it was really cool to see something birthed, grown, and then passed on to somebody else. And the people that were rewarded for actually helping us grow and creating something special were, were part of that accomplishment as well. That was, that was such a great feeling. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's that whole complete cycle that you just talked about. Absolutely. All right. And number 10, what is one thing you'd like to hear a coach, manager, boss, or teammate say about you? Here's what you need to work on the most. Most people always want to hear what, how great they did. I'm the opposite. When I get off stage, I go to my mentors and say, what could I use help with? What could I work on again? And they'll sit there and say, look, this was great. This was great. However, when you were on stage and you scratched your face, you accidentally flipped off the audience and go fantastic. Be cognizant of that. But when you master your craft, and you really are that detailed, that's where you grow. So I'd much rather have my mentor tell me, you know, a good mentor will tell you what you need to hear and not always what you want to hear. For sure. That's an excellent, that's an excellent number 10 answer. I love it, Greg. Can I ask you one final question or two final questions really quick? What is your favorite question to ask in an interview? I've never Googled anybody before I interview them because I don't want to get subconsciously other questions they've already asked. Yeah. So I always go personal and it's different from every single person. So when I'm talking to somebody, I would just go personal with them. And, and, and that's what it comes down to. Uh, for myself, it seems like if you just ask the typical business questions, you get the typical business answers, but if you can get to their heart and talk about, you know, what did their parents think about you know, their first success that they had, or, you know, what do your kids have a clue what it is that you even do for a living? Or if you get more towards their heart space, then all of a sudden it changes the diet, you know, the, the paradigm of the conversation and, and you get to the heart of the matter. Fantastic. I don't think we've got time for it, but the next time I talk to you, maybe I'll ask you that question to start with. What did your parents, what did your parents think about that first success? Well, it's so funny, and I have to end on this, is that when I, I was leaving the house when I was like 18, 17 years old, my dad says, okay, you graduated high school, you got to go to college. You can go to any college you want. We'll pay for it where you want to go. And I said, absolutely not. I'm out. He goes, what are you talking about? I go, I'm going into sales, marketing. And I go, I just like talking to people. I like communicating. I, I go, I think this is my career. And my dad looks at me straight in the eye and says, son, you're never going to make money talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny we just had family day at the horse races and uh we were just we're talking about that this last weekend going boy you proved us wrong on that one so <laughs> the realities are that's my that's my life but thanks for having me i appreciate you greatly dan if there's anything i can do to be a contribution you let me know and i'll talk to you soon greg thank you so much i'll be in touch anytime bye buddy have a great day bye So there you have it. That is a force of nature. That was Greg Reed. There's a few things I'd like to point out. Firstly, how grateful I am to Greg for giving me the time he did to come on the show and share his insights and story. This is a guy who was honored at the Novus Summit, which is a celebration held at the United Nations for 17 of the world's top innovators. In 2016, 
Greg was one of those people. And whether it's at the United Nations or speaking to a guy in Melbourne, Australia on a brand new podcast, the energy and the passion and the integrity that he brings is exactly the same. It speaks volumes to the sort of man that he is and his commitment to serving others. That was certainly one for the highlight reel. I must also give a shout out to Linda. She was in the background all the way through this and for doing the backwards and forwards on the emails, getting the scheduling together and basically making the planets align. Linda, you have my gratitude and admiration forever. Now, with all that said and done, what did you guys think? Obviously, I want to know what you liked about the conversation, what parts stood out for you, and how will you implement some of those ideas and the mindsets that Greg shared? There's no doubt that they're incredibly powerful and could do amazing things for the team that you're a part of. Now, I'm also keen to get any feedback on how you found the shorter episode. There's been a couple of these now where we've sort of been pressed for time and and things have gone a little bit quicker than usual. And I'm desperate to know if you guys have a preference. At the moment, I try and clock the interviews in at around the hour mark. But if you all think that 45 minutes is long enough, then I'm down with that. And perhaps we can change things up a bit. After all, as Greg said, it's all about being flexible, right? So jump on Facebook, send me an email or hit us up on Instagram and let's talk about all that stuff. Which brings me to my last little bit of information, and that is some of the changes that I've made to social media and a new campaign that I've launched to help try and bring some more support for the show and take it to the next level. Firstly, social media. Yes, the show is still on Facebook and Twitter using the handle at BarnraisersPod. However, on Instagram, I've changed the account to at DanJStones. Now, if you're already following me, that won't be a problem. But if you're new to the show and you're looking to, then you will need to put in at Dan J Stones on Instagram. And remember that S on the end. A lot of people, (laughs) a lot of people leave that out. And the reason for this was pretty simple. I just wanted to be able to share a little bit more about myself and the other things that I do. Things like the events that I run for my company, Shifting Peers, the other books, podcasts, and things that I stumble upon from time to time, and also some of those day-to-day moments that make up my life as well. So that's Instagram at Dan J Stones. Finally, the other bit of news. I've just launched a brand new Patreon page. If you don't know what this is, then head over to the page. You'll find the link in the show notes, but it's www.barnraiserspodcast.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. It's basically a membership club for barn raisers. So if you do love the show, want to support us and help grow and get up close and personal with me, then this is the place to do it. So check out that website. There's just so much that I want to do with this show and so much potential for us to do great things through talking about and learning about collaboration and teams that it's just mind boggling. However, as I like to say, nothing of value is ever created in isolation. And that's where you guys come in. If you could tip in just a few bucks each month, then I can ramp up operations. Now rest easy, barn raisers will always remain free. But if we can generate enough financial support per month, then I'll have the chance and the means to produce more episodes, deliver bonus content, and perhaps even create some cool merchandise and other training material exclusively for you guys to use with your teams. Ultimately, I want to be able to take this show on the road and to do live episodes with entire teams. Imagine being at an episode where we're filming with the pit crew from the Mercedes Formula One team, or members from the cast of a world-famous TV show, or the team responsible for developing Microsoft XL. In a perfect world, I'd be able to bring those groups together and meet all of them and you at the same time. And I'm asking for your help because as someone who listens to a show like this, I think you'll agree that if we work together on it, then we can make anything happen. So head on over to barnraiserspodcast.com forward slash Patreon and check out that website. Well, I think that just about does it for now. So to you and all the other barn raisers out there, thank you for being so generous with your time, for listening to the show, for sharing it with your friends and for helping us out. I've been Dan Stones. This has been Barn Raisers. And until next time, remember... Focus more on what you put into the team and what you get out will take care of itself. 
Bye for now.